Are altar calls of the 1800s reflected in the Book of Mormon? Why couldn't Ammon marry King Lamoni's daughter? Are horses and chariots on wheels an anachronism in the Book of Mormon? Does the Book of Mormon teach the Christian concept that God is spirit? Or does it teach the LDS concept that God has a physical body? Are there striking similarities between the story of Lamoni and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Hello, Max here. Welcome to the Come Follow Me podcast. This review covers the lesson plan for Alma chapter 17 to 22. Please subscribe to be notified of our upcoming videos. For the sake of time, I will not cite all the parallel phrases and words from the New Testament that are in the Book of Mormon text. While it can be argued that some of the parallels are coincidental, most are so strong that it is impossible not to conclude that their true source is from the King James Bible. For a complete transcript of this lesson, please click on the link in the description below. Perhaps you remember when Alma the Younger and the four sons of King Mosiah were converted. The sons of Mosiah requested to go on a mission to the Lamanites. That permission was granted back in Mosiah 28, 5-9. During all that time, Alma has been serving as president of the Nephite church, fighting the attempted overthrow of the Nephite democracy, and ensuing wars with the rebels and the Lamanites, preaching to the people in Zarahemla and Gideon, preaching and spending time in the prison with Amulek in Ammonihah, traveling to Sidom and healing Zeezrom, and then returning to his home in Zarahemla with Amulek. Alma was a busy man. During all this time, the sons of Mosiah have been preaching the gospel to the Lamanites in the land of Nephi. Imagine Alma's surprise and joy one day, after all these years, as he ran into the sons of Mosiah returning from their missions. The heading note states, An account of the sons of Mosiah, who rejected their rights to the kingdom for the word of God, and went up to the land of Nephi to preach to the Lamanites, their sufferings and deliverance according to the record of Alma, comprising chapters 17 to 26 inclusive. These fourteen years that Ammon, Aaron, Omnar, and Hemni spent among the Lamanites covered the years 91 to 77 BC. It is taken from Mormon's abridgment of the plates. Alma 17.1 And now it came to pass that as Alma was journeying from the land of Gideon southward, away to the land of Manti, behold, to his astonishment, he met with the sons of Mosiah journeying towards the land of Zarahemla. Alma 17.2 Alma was filled with joy to see that his friends had grown strong in knowledge and searched the scriptures diligently. The words, quote, Brethren in the Lord, are also in Philippians 1.14, and, quote, search the scriptures, are in Acts 17.11. Alma 17.3 But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation, and when they taught, they taught with power and authority of God. The words, quote, prayer and fasting, are in Mark 9.29. Alma 17.4 and they had been teaching the word of God for the space of fourteen years among the Lamanites, having had much success in bringing many to the knowledge of the truth. Yea, by the power of their words many were brought before the altar of God to call on his name and confess their sins before him. An altar call was common in the early 1800s. After preaching to a congregation, the pastor would invite people to come forward, confess that they were sinners, and call on the name of Jesus. The phrase, quote, teaching the word of God is also in Acts 18.11. Alma 17, 7 through 8. When the sons of Mosiah had left Zarahemla on their missions, they took their weapons and a select group of others into the wilderness to go up to the land of Nephi. Alma 17.7. 7. In the 1830 edition, page 269, it read, quote, this they'd done that they might provide food, end quote, which was changed in later editions from done to did. Alma 17, verses 9-12, through 12, After fasting and praying, the Lord sent His Spirit to comfort and encourage them. He told them to be patient in long-suffering and afflictions, and to be godly example to the Lamanites. Alma 17, 9, the phrase, quote, If it were possible, is in Acts 27, 39, and, quote, To the knowledge of the truth, is in 2 Timothy 3, 7. Alma 17, 13, when they arrived at the borders of the Lamanites, they decided they could cover more ground if they split up and each preached to a different area of Lamanites. 
The verse reads in part, quote, when they arrived in the borders, end quote. In the 1830 edition, page 270, it read, quote, when they arriven in the borders, end quote. In the 1964 edition, the word arriven was changed to arrived. Alma 1714. This was a very dangerous mission because the Lamanites were a wild and hardened and ferocious people who enjoyed murdering Nephites for their money. Alma 1715. Thus they were a very indolent people, many of whom did worship idols, and the curse of God had fallen upon them because of the traditions of their fathers, notwithstanding the promises of the Lord were extended unto them on the conditions of repentance. Remember, the curse was the withdrawal of the Spirit of God. See 2 Nephi 1.18 and 1 Nephi 12.23. The mark was the dark skin. The promise was that if the Lamanites would repent and live righteously, they would become white like the Nephites. See 3 Nephi 2.14-16. Alma 17.18. Ammon seems to be the eldest of his brothers, so he gives the others a blessing before they take their separate travels throughout the land of the Lamanites. Alma 17.19. Mormon, who is abridging this record, will now focus on Ammon's mission and will tell us about his brother's missions later. And Ammon went to the land of Ishmael, the land being called after the sons of Ishmael, who also became Lamanites. Alma 17.20 As soon as Ammon entered the land of Ishmael, the Lamanites bound him and took him to the king. Alma 17.21 The king's name was Lamoni, who was a descendant of Ishmael. In verses 22-23, Lamoni asks Ammon if he came there to their land in order to live there. Ammon says yes, perhaps even until he dies. Alma 17.24 And it came to pass that King Lamoni was much pleased with Ammon, and caused that his band should be loosed, and he would that Ammon should take one of his daughters to wife. Wow, things were moving pretty fast here. I mean, Ammon is being offered the king's daughter to marry. That was a no-no for a Nephite to marry a Lamanite and mingle their seed, which would bring the curse upon their children. See Alma 3, 6-19. So Ammon had to respectfully decline the king's offer. Besides, Ammon was a missionary and did not have time for a family life right now. Ammon's social status among the Nephites was one of a prince since he was the son of King Mosiah. This would actually make him properly eligible to marry the king's daughter. Alma 17.25 Ammon did not take Lamoni up on his offer, but he did become his trusted servant. Next thing he knew, he was managing the royal flocks. The phrase, quote, according to the custom of the, is from Luke 1.9. In verses 26-28, three days later, when Ammon was watching the flocks near the popular watering hole called the Water of Sebus, a group of Lamanite troublemakers started scattering the flocks. The king's shepherds started panicking, because the last time this happened, the servants were executed by the king. Amos 17, 29-32 Ammon saw this as a golden opportunity to show his godly powers. And maybe he can make some converts in the process. He flattered them with his words to convince the other shepherds to round up the scattered flocks and bring them back to the watering hole, which they successfully did. Amos 17, 29 The phrase, quote, that I may win, is from Philippians 3.8. Alma 17.31. In the 1830 edition, page 272, it read in part, quote, We will reserve the flock, end quote, which was changed in the 1964 edition to read, quote, We will preserve the flock. The phrase, quote, Be of good cheer, is from Matthew 9.2. Alma 17, verses 33-34. After a while, the Lamanite troublemakers showed up again. But before they could scatter the flocks, Ammon ordered the other shepherds to circle the flocks so they would not scatter. Then he went to deal with the troublemakers himself, even though there were many of them. Alma 1734, in the 1830 edition, page 272, it read, quote, Those which stood by the water of Sebus, and they were not in number of very few. In the 1964 edition, it was changed to read, quote, those who stood by the waters of Sebus, and they were in number not a few. End quote. Alma 1735. Therefore they did not fear Ammon, 
For they supposed that one of their men could slay him according to their pleasure, for they knew not that the Lord had promised Mosiah that he would deliver his sons out of their hands. Neither did they know anything concerning the Lord. Therefore they delighted in the destruction of their brethren, and for this cause they stood to scatter the flocks of the king. Alma 17, 36-38 But Ammon dealt with them pretty easily. He killed six of them with his sling and stones. When the troublemakers failed to hit Ammon with their slings, they came at him with clubs. But when they raised their clubs against him, Ammon chopped off their arms with his sword. He only killed the leaders with his sword, and the others ran off. Ammon was like a superhero. Alma 1738. In the 1830 edition, page 272, it read, quote, But he slew none, save it were their leaders. End quote. The words, with his swords, were omitted. The phrase, with his swords, were added in later editions. Alma 1739. And when he had driven them afar off, he returned, and they watered their flocks, and returned them to the pasture of the king, and then went in unto the king, bearing the arms which had been smitten off by the sword of Ammon of those who sought to slay him. And they were carried in unto the king for a testimony of the things which they had done. So these severed appendages were subsequently carried to the king, which must have been quite a sight. The phrase, quote, sought to slay him is in John 5.16, and, quote, for a testimony of things which is similar to Hebrews 3.5. Alma 18.1, the shepherds and servants of Lamoni all testified of the things they saw. The phrase, quote, things which they had seen is in Luke 9.36. Alma 18.2, when Lamoni learned of all these heroic events, he said, Surely this is more than a man. Behold, is not this the great spirit who doth send such great punishments upon this people because of their murders? In verse 3, the servants were not so sure, but they did admit Ammon was strong and invincible, and a friend to the king. The phrase, quote, and said, whether he be a great spirit or a man, we know not, but this much we do know, end quote, is similar to John 9.25. Alma 18.4 but the king was convinced that Ammon was the great spirit of whom their ancestor father spoke about. Wouldn't you know it? The Lamanites, Native Americans, refer to God as the great spirit. In verses 5-7, through seven, Lamoni began to fear that he had done wrong in the past by killing his servants who had watched over his flocks and allowing them to be scattered by the Lamanite troublemakers. Alma 18.7 In the 1830 edition, page 273, it read, Quote, now it was the practice of the Lamanites, end quote, which was changed in the later editions to read, quote, Now it was the practice of these Lamanites. End quote. Emma 18.8 King Lamoni wanted to meet this man of great power. Where was he? In verse 9, he told the king that Ammon was busy feeding the king's horses and getting the chariot ready for the king's upcoming trip to the land of Nephi. Archaeologists have been unable to find remains of any chariots in the Western Hemisphere. No beasts of burden, like horses, nor wheeled transportation, have ever been discovered dating before pre-Columbian times. North American horses became extinct around the same time as the woolly mammoths during the Ice Age, and were reintroduced in the Americas in the 1500s by the Spanish. In the absence of any animals that could be domesticated and capable of pulling vehicles, the wheel was not of economic importance and was not used by real-life pre-Columbian inhabitants of the Americas. In verse 10, when Lamoni heard this, he was astonished at Ammon's faithfulness. No servant of his has ever been so obedient and trustworthy. Alma 18.11 Now I surely know that this is the great spirit, and I would desire him that he come in unto me, but I durst not. He dared not face Ammon if he was the great spirit. Alma 18.12 When Ammon entered the room, he saw the countenance, or the look on the face of the king, had changed, and he immediately turned around to leave. Alma 18.13 And one of the king's servants said unto him, Rabbana, which is being interpreted powerful or great king, considering their kings to be powerful. And thus he said unto him, Rabbana, the king desireth thee to stay. The phrase, quote, which is being interpreted, is in John 1.41. Alma 18.14, Ammon turned to the king and asked him what he could do for him. 
but the king was tongue-tied for an hour and did not know what to say to Ammon. The phrase, quote, What wilt thou that I should do for thee? is similar to Mark 10.51. Alma 18.16 And it came to pass that Ammon, being filled with the Spirit of God, therefore he perceived the thoughts of the king. Ammon then brags a bit about killing people with his sling and chopping off their arms. Verse 17, But Ammon reminds the king that he is just a man here to serve the king in whatever is right. Verse 18, Lamoni was impressed that Ammon could read his thoughts. The king asked him, Who art thou? Art thou that great spirit who knows all things? The phrase, quote, When the king heard these words, he marveled, is similar to Matthew 22:22. 22, 22. In verse 19, Ammon said he was not. Alma 18:20. And the king said, How knowest thou the thoughts of my heart? Thou mayest speak boldly and tell me concerning these things, and also tell me by what power ye slew and smote off the arms of my brethren that scattered my flocks. The words, quote, speak boldly, are in Acts 18.26, and, quote, by what power, are the same in Acts 4.7, and, quote, ye slew and, are in Acts 5.30. Alma 18.21. The king makes an offer to Ammon that if Ammon would share with him the secret of his powers, the king would give Ammon anything he desired. In verse 22, what a golden opportunity for Ammon to now do what he came there to do. Now Ammon, being wise yet harmless, he said unto Lamoni, Wilt thou hearken unto my words if I tell thee by what power I do these things? And this is the thing that I desire of thee. The phrase, quote, wise yet harmless, is similar to Matthew 10, 16, and, quote, I tell thee by what power I do these things, is similar to Mark eleven thirty three, Alma 18, 23. And the king answered him and said, Yea, I will believe all thy words. And thus he was caught with guile. In other words, Ammon had Lamoni right where he wanted him. The words, quote, believe all, are in Luke 24, 25, and, quote, caught with guile, are in 2 Corinthians 12, 16. Alma 18, 24-25. And Ammon began to speak unto him with boldness, and said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? And he answered and said unto him, I do not know what that meaneth. In verse 26, Ammon will simplify. And then Ammon said, Believest thou that there is a great spirit? Verses 27-28. And he said, Yea. And Ammon said, This is God. And Ammon said unto him again, Believest thou that this great Spirit, who is God, created all things which are in heaven and in the earth? The words created all things are in Ephesians 3.9. If this great Spirit is the pre-incarnate Jesus who created all things in heaven and earth, did he create Satan? Did he create Father in heaven? Ammon just said the great Spirit, which Mormons believe to be Jesus before he was born, created all all things. Does all things mean all things? That would also mean that the Great Spirit himself was uncreated. He is uncaused and self-existing. This Great Spirit in the Book of Mormon appears to have been Joseph Smith's idea, possibly derived from the notion that some native North Americans in his day believed in such a thing. Did Ammon take the occasion here to clarify the LDS concept that God is actually not just a spirit, but that in fact he has a tangible body? No, he does not. And why? Because the entire Book of Mormon is mainly monotheistic throughout, which is in line with Smith's theological concepts at the time the Book of Mormon was written around 1828-29. There are no teachings in the Book of Mormon confirming that God has a body. There are, however, many like these verses that confirm that he does not. Alma 18.29 and he said, Yea, I believe that he created all things which are in the earth, but I do not know the heavens. Lamoni was being honest. Verse 30. And Ammon said unto him, The heavens is a place where God dwells, and all his holy angels. Alma 18.31. Now the king starts asking questions, which is always a good sign of an investigator. And King Lamoni said, Is it above the earth? Verse 32. And Ammon said, Yea. And he looketh down upon all the children of men, and he knows all the thoughts and intents of the heart, for by his hand were they all created from the beginning. 
The phrase, quote, the thoughts and intents of the heart, is from Hebrews 4.12, Alma 1833. And King Lamoni said, I believe all these things which thou hast spoken. Art thou sent from God? The words, quote, these things which thou hast, are in Acts 26.16, and, quote, sent from God, are in John 1.6, Alma 1834. Ammon said unto him, I am a man, and man in the beginning was created after the image of God, and I am called by his Holy Spirit to teach these things unto this people, that they may be brought to a knowledge of that which is just and true. The words, quote, after the image of, are in Colossians 3.10, and, quote, that which is just and, are in Colossians 4.1. Ammon confirms here that man was created after the spirit image of God not bodily image of God, which is in line with mainstream Christianity at the time of Joseph Smith. The Christian concept of the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, is not developed until after Jesus' mortal ministry. In Judaism, the Holy Spirit alluded only to God's energy in the Old Testament. For Ammon to state that he was called by the Holy Spirit is just another anachronism. Alma 1835 and a portion of that Spirit dwelleth in me, which giveth me knowledge, and also power according to my faith and desires which are in God. The words, quote, dwelleth in me, are in John 6, 56. Alma 18, 36-39. Ammon taught King Lamoni everything from the creation to Adam and the fall of man, Lehi's journey from Jerusalem, the rebellion of Laman, Lemuel, and the sons of Ishmael, the plan of redemption, and the coming of Christ. Alma 1836, the phrase, quote, the creation of the world, is from Romans 1.20, and, quote, the Holy Scriptures, is in Romans 1.2. Alma 1837, in the 1830 edition, page 276, it read, quote, and all their sufferings with hunger and thirst, and their travel, and persancy, end quote. This was changed in later editions to read, quote, and their travail. This same error shows up in 2 Nephi 29.4 and Mosiah 14.11. In this verse, and no less than five times in the 1830 edition, is the abbreviation ampersand C, meaning and so forth, used. It is hardly believable that such a symbol as ampersand C was a translation from ancient writings. This kind of mistake is clear evidence of recent origin of the book. Alma 1839 Ammon explains the plan of redemption. And he also made known unto them concerning the coming of Christ. Ammon is supposedly teaching this in 90 BC, but there was no word for the title of Christ at that time, and it is not one that Ammon could have known or used in any language. The concept of Messiah is one thing, but the title of Christ is entirely another. The concept of Jesus as the Christ is a concept that did not exist in Judaism or the Old Testament. Alma 1840. The king believed all that Ammon taught him. Alma 1841. And he began to cry unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, have mercy according to thy abundant mercy which thou hast had upon the people of Nephi, have upon me and my people. The words abundant mercy are in 1 Peter 1.3. Alma 1842. And now when he had said this, he fell unto the earth as if he were dead. The phrase, quote, when he said this, he fell, is in Acts 7.60, Alma 1843. And it came to pass that his servants took him and carried him in unto his wife, and laid him upon a bed. And he lay as if he were dead for the space of two days and two nights. And his wife and his sons and his daughters mourned over him after the manner of the Lamanites, greatly lamenting his loss. Everyone thought the king was dead, except Ammon, of course. Alma 19. I want to point out the similarities between this story about Lamoni and the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. First, in both stories, a man seems to die, and a period of time passes. Second, both Martha and the queen use the words, he stinketh. Third, both Ammon and Jesus use the word, sleepeth. Fourth, both Ammon and Jesus say that a man shall rise again. Fifth, the conversation between Ammon and the queen contained phrases strangely similar to those used by Jesus and Martha. Six, in both cases, the man arose or came forth. The parallels are so striking 
that one has to conclude that sometime after the King James Bible was published in A.D. 1611, someone copied from it to create the Book of Mormon story. Alma 19, 1-3 By now, people are convinced that King Lamoni was dead. He had been lying motionless on his bed for two days, so Lamoni's wife, the queen without a name, called for Ammon to ask him what to do. Alma 19, 4 And she said unto him, The servants of my husband have made it known unto me that thou art a prophet of a holy God, and that thou hast power to do many mighty works in his name. The words, quote, Many works, are in Matthew 13, 58. Alma 19, 5 Nobody was quite sure whether or not the king was dead. This issue seems to hinge on whether or not the king stunk. You see, a person is only truly dead when they start stinking. Some people said that he stunk. The king will not appreciate those remarks. But to the queen, he did not stink. The words, quote, is not dead, are in Matthew 9.24, and, quote, he stinketh, are in John 11.39. Alma 19.6. Ammon was smart enough not to comment about the king's stinking. Now this was what Ammon desired, for he knew that King Lamoni was under the power of God. He knew that the dark veil of unbelief was being cast away from his mind, and the light which did light up his mind, which was the light of the glory of God, which was the marvelous light of his goodness, yea, this light had infused such joy into his soul, the cloud of darkness having been dispelled, and that the light of everlasting life was lit up in his soul, yea, he knew that this had overcome his natural frame, and he was carried away in God. The words, quote, marvelous light, are in 1 Peter 2, 9, and, quote, of everlasting life, is in Acts 13, 46. In the 1830 edition, page 277, it read, quote, and the light of everlasting light, end quote, with the word that left out, and the second light changed to life, in the 1964 edition, which now reads, quote, and that the light of everlasting life, end quote. Alma 19, 7-8. Ammon informed the queen that her husband was not dead. He sleepeth in God. He will rise up tomorrow. Obviously, this story is symbolic of death and resurrection of the Savior. Alma 19.8, the phrase, quote, He shall rise again, is in Matthew 20.19. Alma 19.9-11, Ammon asked her if she believed him. She said, sure, why not? Ammon said there is not a single Nephite with stronger faith than hers. Then she waited by the king's bed until the next day to see what would happen. Alma 19.9, the words, quote, Believest thou this, are in John 11.26. Alma 19.10, the phrase, quote, I said unto thee, woman, there has not been such a great faith among all the people of the Nephites, is similar to Luke 9.7. Alma 19.12-13. And it came to pass that he arose, according to the words of Ammon, and as he arose, he stretched forth his hand unto the woman, and said, Blessed be the name of God, and blessed art thou. For as sure as thou livest, behold, I have seen my Redeemer. And he shall come forth and be born of a woman, and he shall redeem all mankind who believe on his name. Now when he had said these words, his heart was swollen within him, and he sunk again with joy. And the queen also sunk down, being overpowered by the Spirit. The phrase, quote, believe on his name, is in John 1, 12, and, quote, again with joy, is in Luke 10, 12. Alma 19, 14. Now Ammon, seeing the Spirit of the Lord, poured out according to his prayers upon the Lamanites his brethren, who had been the cause of so much mourning among the Nephites, or among all the people of God, because of their iniquities and their traditions, he fell upon his knees, and began to pour out his soul in prayer and thanksgiving to God for what he had done for his brethren. And he was also overpowered with joy, and thus they all three had sunk to the earth. The words, thanksgiving to God, are from 2 Corinthians 9.11. Alma 19.15 This was starting to have a domino effect. Even the servants who started to pray fell down to the earth. Alma 19.16 Everyone fell down except for a Lamanite woman named Abish, who was a mistress to the queen. Abish had been a convert to the Lord for many years on an account of her father seeing a vision, but she had kept it a secret from everyone. We notice that women play such an unimportant role in the Book of Mormon, 
whereas the Bible lists the names of scores and scores of women. In the Book of Mormon, which comprises a span of 1,021 years of Nephite and Lamanite history, plus another 2,000 years of Jaredite history, only three original women are named. There was Sariah, Nephite's mother and the only Nephite woman, in 1 Nephi 2.5, Abish, this Lamanite woman mentioned here in Alma 1916, and Isabel, the Lamanite harlot, in Alma 39.3. The only other women mentioned by name are taken directly from the Bible, Sarah, Eve, and Mary. A grand total of six names. We have two episodes talking about this. Check out the links in the description below. The 1830 edition contains dozens of misspelled words. In this verse, it originally read yars, which was changed in later editions to years. Alma 1917. Abish thought this would be a great opportunity to let everyone know what was happening through the power of God. So she ran from house to house, spreading the news. The phrase, from house to house, is from Luke 10.7. Alma 1918, a multitude of people gathered at the king's house. When they saw everyone laying on the ground, as if they were dead, they noticed Ammon among them. Verse 19, the town folk complained that a great evil had come upon their king's household because a Nephite was allowed to remain in their land. In verses 20 through 21, others said it was because Ammon had killed some of the troublemakers at the waters of Sebus. Alma 19.22, one of them, whose brother was killed by Ammon, drew his sword and was going to slay Ammon, when suddenly that man fell dead. This story reminds me of that one-hit wonder let the bodies hit the floor. They were starting to stack up everywhere. Slain in the spirit, I suppose. The phrase, being exceedingly angry, is in Acts 26.11. Alma 19.23 Because of the promise the Lord made to Mosiah, Ammon could not be slain. Verse 24 Everyone in the room who was witnessing these events wondered what was the cause of this great power and what did it all mean. In the 1830 edition, page 278, it read, quote, The multitude beheld that the man had fell dead, which was changed in the 1964 edition to read, quote, The multitude beheld that the man had fallen dead. Ammon 19, 25-27 Many thought Ammon was the Great Spirit. Others thought he was sent by the Great Spirit. And others said he was a monster who was sent by the Nephites to torment them. Yet others said Ammon was sent by the Great Spirit to afflict them because of their iniquities. Alma 1926, the words, quote, rebuked them, are in Matthew 19.13, and, quote, to torment is in Matthew 8.29. Alma 19.28. And thus the contention began to be exceedingly sharp among them. And while they were thus contending, the woman servant who had caused the multitude to be gathered together came, and when she saw the contention which was among the multitude, she was exceedingly sorrowful even unto tears. The phrase, quote, and thus the contention began to be exceedingly sharp among them, is similar to Acts 15.39. Alma 19.29 And it came to pass that she went and took the queen by the hand, that perhaps she might raise her from the ground. And as soon as she touched her hand, she arose and stood upon her feet, and cried with a loud voice, saying, O blessed Jesus, who has saved me from an awful hell! O blessed God, have mercy on this people! The phrase, quote, went and took the queen by hand, that perhaps she might raise her, is similar to Matthew 9.25. In the Bible, the name Jesus was announced first by an angel to Mary in Luke 1.31, in 1 B.C., However, Alma 1926, dated 90 B.C., has Lamoni's wife speaking to the Lord and calling him Jesus. Do you see the anachronistic problem with this? Every time we see the name Jesus in the Book of Mormon record, before Christ, we have a glaring problem. Alma 19, 30-31, speaking in tongues, and when she had said this, she clasped her hands, being filled with joy, speaking many words which were not understood. And when she had done this, she took the king Lamoni by the hand, and behold, he arose and stood upon his feet. 
And he, immediately seeing the contention among his people, went forth and began to rebuke them, and to teach them the words which he had heard from the mouth of Ammon. And as many as heard his words believed, and were converted unto the Lord. That seems to be a quick conversion of everyone. Was it sincere, or were they just wanting to please the king? In verse 32, many among them refused to listen and believe. Alma 19.33 And it came to pass that when Ammon arose, he also administered unto them, and also did all the servants of Lamoni, and they did all declare unto the people the selfsame thing, that their hearts had been changed, that they had no more desire to do evil. Alma 19.34 Many said they conversed with angels while they were in the trance. In verse 35, those who believed in their words were baptized, and they established a church among them. Alma 1936. And thus the work of the Lord did commence among the Lamanites. Thus the Lord did begin to pour out His Spirit upon them. And we see that His arm is extended to all people who will repent and believe on His name. Alma 20. Remember Lamoni's father, who was king over all the land, and who had allowed his sons to serve as local kings under his authority. He had invited Lamoni to come to a feast which he had prepared for his sons. Lamoni had not shown up because he was too busy establishing the church in his land. Lamoni's father was furious, and without Lamoni's knowledge decided to travel from his headquarters in the land of Nephi to see what happened to his son and why he had not come to the feast. Ammo 20 verse 1 At the same time, Lamoni wanted to take Ammon to the land of Nephi and introduce him to his father. Ammo 20 verse 2 and the voice of the Lord came to Ammon, saying, Thou shalt not go up to the land of Nephi, for behold, the king will seek thy life. But thou shalt go to the land of Madoni, for behold, thy brother Aaron, and also Mulekai and Amma are in prison. The phrase, the voice of the Lord came, is in Acts 7.31. Ammon 20, verse 3, Ammon told Lamoni there was a change of plans. In verse 4, Lamoni said, I will go with you because the king of Madoni is a friend of mine, and I will talk him into releasing your brothers from prison. In the 1830 edition, page 280, it read, quote, Who told thee that thy brethren were in prison? End quote. The word thy was changed in later editions to my. Alma 20, verses 8 through 9. As they were traveling in their chariots, which did not exist in the New World at the time, they unexpectedly met up with Lamoni's father, who wanted to know why the no-show at the feast. Alma 20, verse 8. In the 1830 edition, page 280, it read, quote, As Ammon and Lamoni was a journeying thither. End quote. But in later editions, the word a uh, has been deleted. Alma 20, verse 9. The words, quote, Not come to the feast are in John 11:56. End quote that great day when I made a feast, are similar to John 7.37. Alma 20 verse 10, Lamoni's father was shocked to see his son in the company of a white guy. He wanted to know where he was going with this pale-faced Nephite. In verses 11 through 12, Lamoni told his father why he had not come to the party, and where he and Ammon were headed to now. Alma 20 verse 13, and now when Lamoni had rehearsed unto him all these things, behold, to his astonishment, his father was angry with him, and said, Lamoni, thou art going to deliver these Nephites who are sons of a liar. Behold, he robbed our fathers, and now his children are also come amongst us, that they may, by their cunning and their lyings, deceive us, that they again may rob us of our property. The tradition of the Lamanites was that Nephi and others had lied, cheated, and wronged Laman and Lemuel out of leadership positions, as well as the brass plates and other treasures. See Mosiah 10, 12-13. So the resentment has been passed down to their descendants. Alma 20, verse 14. Lamoni's father commanded him to kill Ammon and turn his chariot around and head back to the land of Ishmael. In the 1830 edition, page 286, it read, quote, through faith and repentance, ampersand C. In later editions, ampersand C is changed to read and so forth. Alma 20, verses 15 through 16. When Lamoni refused to obey his father, the king was angry enough that
that he drew his own sword that he might kill his own son. Alma 20, 17 through 18. But Ammon stood forth and said unto him, Behold, thou shalt not slay thy son. Nevertheless, it were better that he should fall than thee. For behold, he has repented of his sins. But if thou shouldst fall at this time in thine anger, thy soul could not be saved. And again it is expedient that thou shouldst forbear. For if thou shouldst slay thy son, he being an innocent man, his blood would cry from the ground to the Lord his God for vengeance to come upon thee. And perhaps thou wouldst lose thy soul. In verses 19-20, through the king decided to kill Ammon instead. When he attempted to slay him with his sword, Ammon smote his arm that he could not use it. Ammon is really good at disarming people. Alma 2019, the phrase, quote, sought to destroy him, is from Luke 1947. Alma 2021, when the king saw that Ammon could kill him, he pleaded for his life. Alma 20, verse 22, Ammon raised his sword and promised to kill the king unless he was granted that his brothers be released from prison. If Ammon had killed the king, would not he be guilty of murder? Of course, if Nephi could cut off the head of a defenseless, inebriated Laban and be called a righteous prophet, see 1 Nephi 4.18, then anything is possible in the Book of Mormon. Alma 20, verse 23. Now the king, fearing he should lose his life, said, If thou wilt spare me, I will grant unto thee whatsoever thou wilt ask, even to half of the kingdom. I am wondering how realistic this situation could be. Would the head of the king of the land travel without bodyguards for protection? What is Lamoni doing this whole time, while his father and Ammon are struggling to kill each other? The whole story sounds a little unrealistic. Alma 20 verse 24 Ammon bargains with the old king to spare his life, if he would free his brothers from prison and let Lamoni retain his kingdom. Alma 20 verses 25-26 the old king was forced to agree with Ammon's terms. In verse 27, Lamoni's father desired that once his brothers were set free, that they and Ammon come to his kingdom to teach him. Crazy, they were one minute about to kill each other. Now they are BFFs. Alma 20, 28. Ammon and Lamoni proceeded to Madoni, where they got the men released from prison. In verse 29, Ammon's brothers were in pretty bad shape. They were naked, they had rope burns, and they were thirsty and hungry. They had experienced a completely different reception as missionaries in Madoni than Ammon got in Ishmael. In verse 30, Ammon's brothers told him the short version of how they ended up in prison, how people did not believe their preaching. They were cast out of each town they came to and eventually ended up in prison for many days before being delivered now by Lamoni and Ammon. Ammon 21 as noted, chapter 21 to 26 contains an account of the experiences of Ammon's brother Aaron and others as they preached to the Lamanites. Alma 21 1. Now, when Ammon and his brethren separated themselves in the borders of the land of the Lamanites, behold, Aaron took his journey towards the land which was called by the Lamanites Jerusalem, calling it after the land of their father's nativity, and it was a way joining the borders of Mormon. Apparently, the land of Mormon was where Alma, the elder, and his people had lived for 24 years before they escaped to Zarahemla. See Mosiah 18.4. Alma 21.2. Now the Lamanites and the Amalekites and the people of Amulon had built a great city which was called Jerusalem. The Amalekites were apostate Nephites, and the people of Amulon were descendants of the wicked priest of King Noah. See Mosiah 23 verses 31-32. Alma 21.3 These people were very hard-hearted and were growing more wicked. Aaron definitely had his work cut out for him. Alma 21.4 And it came to pass that Aaron came to the city of Jerusalem and first began to preach to the Amalekites. And he began to preach to them in their synagogues, for they had built synagogues after the order of the Nehors. For many of the Amalekites and the Amulonites were after the order of the Nehors. The Nehors practiced priestcraft, which was preaching for popularity and wealth. The words, in their synagogues, are in Matthew 4.23. How could the Amalekites know how the Jews built synagogues 
when the Jews were not building them before Lehi left from the New World in 600 BC. They could not have known that the Jews even built synagogues at all. But a writer from the 19th century, who was able to read all of the Bible, would indeed know. The term synagogues, including the plural, occurs 25 times in the Book of Mormon, beginning in 2 Nephi 26, verse 26, about 550 BC. Most scholars believe that synagogues did not come to existence until the Babylonian captivity, which was after Lehi had left Jerusalem and Solomon's temple had been destroyed. Amal 21, verses 5 through 6, the Amalekites began to contend with Aaron, saying that Aaron thinks he is better than they are, and his message is an insult to them. Asking, why don't angels appear to us, and how do you know if we need to repent, and how do you know that we are not a righteous people? Amal 21, 7. Now Aaron said unto him, Believest thou that the Son of God shall come to redeem mankind from their sins? The words, quote, from their sins, are in Matthew 1.21. Amal 21.8, they replied that no one knows such things. It's just foolish traditions to believe all that stuff. The phrase, quote, believe that thou, is in John 11.27, and, quote, do not believe in, is in Romans 15.31, and, quote, of that which is to come, is in 1 Timothy 4.8. Alma 21.9. Now Aaron began to open the scriptures unto them concerning the coming of Christ, and also concerning the resurrection of the dead, and that there could be no redemption for mankind, save it were through the death and sufferings of Christ and the atonement of his blood. I am curious, what does Aaron have for scriptures? Are they copies of metal plates he carries around with him? The phrase, quote, the resurrection of the dead, is in Matthew 22 and 31 and, quote, sufferings of Christ, is in 2 Corinthians 1, 5. Alma 21, verses 10 through 12. As Aaron preached, the people got angry with him, and the rest made fun of him. He realized they were not listening. So he went to the village of Anianti, where Aaron met up with Mulekai and Amma, preaching the word. Being rejected, they entered the land of Madoni and taught there. Alma 21, 10. The phrase, quote, the words which he spake, is from Acts 20, verse 38. Alma 21, 11, in the 1830 edition, page 284, it read, quote, There he found Mulekai a preaching the word. In the later editions, the word a uh, was deleted. Alma 21, 13. They did not convert many people and were eventually thrown into prison where they suffered. In verse 14, at this point, the stories merge. Ammon and Lamoni rescue Aaron and his brethren from jail. The words, suffered many things, are in Matthew 27, 19. Alma 21, 15, they were not willing to give up preaching. Alma 21, 16, and they went forth whithersoever they were led by the Spirit of the Lord, preaching the word of God in every synagogue of the Amalekites, or in every assembly of the Lamanites where they could be admitted. The phrase, quote, led by the Spirit, is from Romans 8.14, and, quote, in every synagogue, is from Acts 22.19. Alma 21.17. And it came to pass that the Lord began to bless them, insomuch that they brought many to the knowledge of the truth. Yea, they did convince many of their sins and of the traditions of their fathers which were not correct. Alma 21.18-22. Mormon will take a moment to tell us what Lamoni and Ammon did after freeing Aaron from prison. Then he will return to the account of Aaron teaching Lamoni's father. Alma 21.21 Ammon and Lamoni returned to the land of Ishmael, Lamoni's home. The king prohibited Ammon from being his servant. He built synagogues for his people. He declared his people a free people and no more oppressed under his father's rule. They had the liberty of worshiping God according to their own desires. Alma 21.23 and Ammon did preach unto the people of King Lamoni. And it came to pass that he did teach them all things concerning things pertaining to righteousness. And he did exhort them daily with all diligence, and they gave heed unto his word, and they were zealous for keeping the commandments of God. Alma 22, verse 1. We now leave Ammon and return to the account of Aaron and his brethren, who after being released from prison, decided to pay a thank you visit to Lamoni's father who was the king of all the land. The words, quote, was led by the Spirit, are in Luke 4.1. Alma 22.2, 2, 
they traveled to the land of Nephi and entered the king's palace to introduce themselves. In verse 3, since he spared their lives from prison, they volunteered to be his servants. But Lamoni's father had other plans for them. But I will insist that ye shall administer unto me, for I have been somewhat troubled in mind because of the generosity and the greatness of the words of thy brother Ammon. And I desire to know the cause why he has not come up out of Madoni with thee. In verse 4, Aaron told him that Ammon was in the land of Ishmael preaching and was too busy to make the trip. Verses 5 through 6, the king had a few questions for Aaron. What was the whole spirit of the Lord thing again? And do I have to repent or not? It was very confusing to him. Alma 22, 7. And Aaron answered him and said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? And the king said, I know that the Amalekites say that there is a God, and I have granted unto them that they should build sanctuaries, that they may assemble themselves together to worship him. And if now thou sayest there is a God, behold, I will believe. It seems the king did not believe the Amalekites, but he was willing to trust what Aaron had to say about God. In verse 8, Aaron told him that God did indeed exist. Alma 22, 9-11 And the king said, Is God that great spirit that brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem? And Aaron said unto him, Yea, he is that great spirit. And he created all things, both in heaven and in earth. Believest thou this? And he said, Yea, I believe that the Great Spirit created all things. And I desire that ye should tell me concerning all these things, and I will believe thy words. The phrase, quote, I desire that ye, is in Ephesians 3.13. In Alma 31.15, we read that God is a spirit forever. Even though that verse is in the midst of false doctrines believed by the Zoramites, it is not condemned or corrected by Alma in its context. And it completely supports the teaching here in Alma chapter 18 and 22 that God is the Great Spirit. Also, in Joseph Smith's Lectures of Faith, section 5, 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, page 52-53, it states, quote, The Father being personage of spirit, glory, and power, possessing all perfection and fullness." Quote. But once Joseph Smith changed his theology and began to teach in Doctrine and Covenants 130, verse 22, that, quote, "...the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's." End quote. The LDS Church decided in 1921 to remove these Lectures of Faith sections from the Doctrine and Covenants. We have two episodes dedicated to this topic called God, Spirit, or Body, Part 1 and 2. Links are in the description below. Alma 22, verses 12 to 13. Aaron began to explain from the creation of Adam, the fall, and the plan of redemption through Christ. Alma 22, 13. The phrase, quote, from the creation of, is in Romans 1, 20, and, quote, through Christ, is in Philippians 4, 13, and, quote, believe on his name, is from John 1, 12. Alma 22, 14. And since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. But the sufferings and death of Christ atone for their sins through faith and repentance and so forth. And that he breaketh the bands of death, that the grave shall have no victory, and that the sting of death should be swallowed up in the hopes of glory. And Aaron did expound all these things unto the king. The author of the Book of Mormon not only loved to duplicate Paul's travels, but also Paul's speech as evidenced in this verse. The phrase, quote, through faith and, is in Hebrews 6, 12, and, quote, grave shall have no victory, is from 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and, quote, the sting of death is from 1 Corinthians 15, 56, and, quote, swallowed up and, is from 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Here and elsewhere in the Book of Mormon is taught the false idea that Adam and the prophets who followed him were all taught that Christ would atone for their sins. The fact is, that was an absolute impossibility, because the Hebrews would have recorded it and lived by that idea. No Old Testament prophet recorded any such teaching. Alma 22.15, how the king now responds, will be music to the ears of any Mormon missionary. And it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded these things unto him, the king said, 
What shall I do that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit, that I may be filled with joy, that I may not be cast off at the last day? Behold, said he, I will give up all that I possess, yea, I will forsake my kingdom, that I may receive this great joy. The words, quote, born of God, are from 1 John 3, 9. And, quote, I may be filled with joy, are in 2 Timothy 1, 4. Alma 22, 16. Aaron gave him the good news that all he had to do is bow down before God and repent and call on God's name in faith. Alma 22:17. So King Lamoni knelt down and prostrated himself as he offered up his prayer. Alma 22.18 O God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee, and that I may be raised from the dead and be saved at the last day. And now when the king had said these words, he was struck as if he were dead. Slain in the Spirit? Alma 22, verses 19 through 21. Now, this event will seem familiar in some ways to what we read about when Ammon shared the gospel with Lamoni Jr. In verse 20, the king's servants ran to the queen and told her what happened to her husband. When she saw him laying there as if dead, she ordered the servants to kill Aaron and his brethren. But the servants were afraid to lay their hands on them. So the queen commanded her servants to go get others that they might kill the missionaries. The words, they durst not, are from Luke 20, verse 40, and, quote, lay their hands on, are in Luke 21, 12, verses 22 through 23. Fearing what was about to happen to him and his brethren, Aaron, Therefore he put forth his hand, and raised the king from the earth, and said unto him, Stand. And he stood upon his feet, receiving his strength. And the king stood forth, and began to minister unto them. And he did minister unto them in so much that his whole household were converted unto the Lord. The phrase, quote, And when they saw it, they, as in Luke 19.7. Alma 22.27 Then the king made a proclamation throughout all the land and regions about. We will learn what the proclamation said in our next Book of Mormon episode. In verses 28-34, this chapter pretty much ends with Mormon giving us a long geography lesson. Alma 2232, in the 1830 edition, page 288, it read, quote, The land of Nephi and the land of Zarahemla was nearly surrounded. In later editions, was is changed to were. Alma 2235, Mormon concludes, And now I, after having said this, Return again to the account of Ammon and Aaron, Omner and Himni and their brethren. As a closing comment, the monotheistic theology of Joseph Smith, at the time the Book of Mormon was written, comes through in Alma chapters 18 and 22 as much as anywhere else. The Great Spirit is God in Smith's mind. God does not have a body, and this is confirmed over and over again in the Book of Mormon. Had he already developed his later concept that God had a physical body, the Book of Mormon would be replete with such references. Yet all of them confirm just the opposite. The Book of Mormon is actually a powerful witness against Smith in every way imaginable. Joseph was entirely monotheistic until at least 1835, and the book is compelling evidence that he did not have a first vision in 1820 and that his whole plurality of God's concept was a mid to late 1830s idea, which he backdated to 1820 for dramatic effect. This concludes our study for today. Please subscribe so you won't miss any of our future episodes. You can catch us on YouTube, Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast. Or you can go to our website at talkingtomormons.com, where you can learn much more. God bless.